right, so quick introduction. This next uh, section is a case study that uh, where Ryan and I went and worked with PZ Printing and uh, he was, as Ryan was just explaining, that dirt in the, in the paint was something that those guys realized that they, they had quality problems and uh, they needed to fix them. And so Ryan, uh, I'll introduce Ryan. He is a, a incredible lean manufacturing expert. He was once the CEO or COO of Power Blanket and has helped companies all over the country and especially throughout Utah improve their manufacturing processes and doing that by focusing on developing their people. And that's something that Ryan is really passionate about is making sure that the people side of things are being taken care of because we know that focusing on the people is what gets you the real results. So that's Ryan and Ryan and I are going to uh, show you guys a little bit of work that we did over at PZ Printing. All right, looks like we've got uh, Jaden here. I'm gonna, Jaden, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's unmute you. Uh, we'll come up <clears throat> a little bit later. We'll talk about Harvest Lane Honey. There we go, you made a co-host. And uh, so we'll get to your example here in just a minute. And, uh, yeah, I don't see green lights. So. Anyway, so let's, uh, let's rock and roll. Um, okay, so. They had a problem, and this actually started out as uh, Frank Peasy, who's the uh, owner of Peasy Printing, said, "Look, you know, we need to we need to change our our culture." And basically, what they said is, "We need to get better quality and better services so that we can compete in the markets in the marketplace." So they do printed goods and services. They print everything from, you know, stationery and scrapbook paper to envelopes to package printing for all of your commercial products that you buy in the store. You know, anything that's printed and packaged boxes. Uh, brochures, flyers, uh, you name it, they print it. So if your company has any printing needs, you can go to PZ Printing. If you can think it up and put it on a paper napkin, uh, they can make it for you. So as we started to figure out, you know, what are all the headaches and problems that uh, you guys are facing? We looked at their entire value stream and we said, okay, where are the problems? And we found problems all throughout the value stream. And then we said to ourselves, okay, well, where should we start? Well, and as a rule of thumb, a good principle is to start as early on in the process as you can. So if you want to fix uh, your entire value stream, any mistake that you make at the very beginning has a ripple effect all the way through your value stream. So we looked at the very first process that they have at PZ Printing, which is taking a customer order. So a customer calls up and has an idea and they say, I've got these requirements and I want you to do this, that, and the other. If any part of that goes wrong, they will design the product incorrectly, then they will go and manufacture the product incorrectly, and then we'll get to the customer and the customer will say, whoa, whoa, that's not what I wanted. And by then you've invested all this time and all this energy and it's, a, it's, it's very expensive. And then the customer's not happy. And of course, as a business, you're not making money. And we asked ourselves, okay, how often is this happening? What are we gonna do about it? So that was what our problem statement. So what we're going to do is we're gonna walk you through a DMAIC project. A DMAIC is a five-step problem solving process that goes through defining the problem, measuring the process, analyzing the results to find out what the root cause is, implementing improvements, and then controlling the process to sustain any change improvements that we've made. So in the very first step of that process is the define phase. And in the define phase, the key tool is the project charter. And that's what you see in front of you here. We have a problem statement in the project charter to clarify what we're working on. And this says inaccurate information and specifications are leading to waste variation and overburdening as we bring on new customers. And this is important because it's vital to meeting our internal external customer expectations and to the viability of PZ printing. So we're learning a couple of cool things here. Number one, we have to get this process right and we know why we're working on this project. That's important in the defined phase. So what's our goal? We wanna increase the estimate request accuracy to 90% and do it by July 9th. So what's our current accuracy? Well, 74%. We didn't have this data at first, we had to go and get it. But once we got it, we realized, wow, 74%, that means one out of four times we get the customer information wrong that they, as far as what they want to order, which is obviously not good. It's leading to a lot of rework and a lot of expense. All right, you want to bump me to the next slide here? Yep, there we go. So there's the team. We got a whole crew in there and uh, for a lot of these folks, continuous improvement and the idea of doing a lean project or a Kaizen event was, new to them. Uh, the great thing that we had with PZ Printing is an, uh, just an awesome attitude. Everybody on the team was like, okay, let's figure this out. Let's do it. They were very open-minded and very willing to uh, dive into the problem. So uh, kudos to them for that. That's the best way to start a project is just doing it with a great attitude. So 
The next step in the DMAIC process is to get to the measure phase. So we've defined the problem. Now we're going to measure the process. There's a lot of tools for this. We use uh, process maps, uh, fancy process maps, which are called value stream maps. In this case, we have a, a version of a process map called a swim lane diagram. It's a swim lane because on the left-hand side, you'll see customer sales and estimators. Those are each of the rows of the swim lane. And then going across the swim lane, you can see all the different steps and interactions that happen. What you'll notice here is that um, the process goes from the customer to sales, from sales to the estimators, and then it bounces back and forth. Anytime there's a handoff between one group and another in a process, guess what can happen? Mistakes, right? Errors. Information not getting passed off correctly. We talked in a previous session about the telephone game where you start off with knowing what you want. By the time it gets passed three rows down, you have something entirely different. So there's lots of gaps and places where information could either get lost or not be collected in this process. Next slide. So one of the tools that comes out of a value stream map is your gap list. And we always start our gap list with a problem is. So looking at that value stream map, we looked at every step in the process and we said, what can go wrong there? And then we started our statements. A problem is our customers aren't sure of how to communicate their needs. That was the very first problem we ran into. Customers don't speak the printing language. They don't know about different weights of papers necessarily, different glosses, different types of ink, different types of printing processes. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we as the printers know that the customer doesn't know. All they know is that they want a product that looks a certain way. So it's our job as the printer to get that information out of the customer in terms we understand and have a translation from what the customer is trying to explain. So right out of the get-go, we have a disconnect between the customer and us. And, and when we're trying to create a, a requirements list, this is really challenging. So then we came up with more no, problems. Problem. Problem yeah. Oh, sorry, I heard someone else jump in. A problem is a customer is unsure of their needs and expectations. They don't even know exactly what they want. A problem is a language barrier between the print logo and the customer and the communication. So we went through this list of problems and typically when you do a Lean and Six Sigma project, you realize quickly that there isn't a silver bullet. There's not one problem there. If we fix that one problem, everything's going to get better. We realized that we had to kind of fix all of these problems because any one of these could lead to an error or a defect. So um, then came the big process of, all right, how, how are we going to do that, right? So we had to, first of all, go and collect more data. We realized that we didn't have enough data to make process changes just yet. We needed to know where the problems were happening. So we started to collect data about how are these different uh, customer requests coming in? How many are coming in through the RFQ tool, which is 65%? How many are, are coming in through email, uh, phone, hand-delivered? Um, and so we looked at each of these delivery methods and we said, how many of these are actually complete? And how many of these are correct and accurate? Next slide. And then we looked at the different methods of completing. So what, what method are people using? So people, some people are using the online RFQ method. Some people are using email. Some people are just using an email quote revision. But the vast majority, 47 uh, uh, out of our, you know, what's that, about 49% of our total submissions were done through email. And we realized pretty quickly that this was a major problem. So anytime somebody's emailing you uh, a customer quote, they're just typing it in. They're just saying, well, the customer wants this paper and this print and this uh, type and this size and, and all these sorts of things. How many different ways can that email go wrong? A lot. A lot. I mean, it's just, it's all over the place. There's no standard format. There's no standard work. There's no structure. And therefore, an email is just an email. And that was one of the big root causes to the problem that we were running into. So how did we oh, get that? I think we've got Daniel here. Oh, hey, Daniel. Yay. Excellent. Gonna make Daniel. It'll show up under preview. Yeah, got him. Hey, oh, we'll, just, we'll just make Daniel uh, co-host here and. Daniel, Daniel, let me know when you can hear me. All right. I'll uh, keep going while while Daniel joins here. So, okay. we. There we go. I think we got him. We got him. Daniel, welcome. Hey, there he is. 
Hello. Sorry for the delay. It was uh, quite the exercise to get this going today. I apologize. No worries. We started without you. I hope you don't mind. No, that's totally fine. So we're just talking about the information that we had to come out of so that we could actually make some smart decisions on, you know, where are we going to go to fix the problem and what is the solution going to look like? And, and I remember at the beginning, we wanted a lot of data, but we didn't have a lot of data. Do you, can you recall the pain and effort it took to go and get the data we needed to find the root cause? And he's gone again. Can you guys hear me okay? Sorry, my computer really having issues. Okay, now we can. Okay, yeah, no, definitely. Like Sage said, we, we started the process and we, we really were able to feel that we had some problems like, like he has alluded to. Uh, but when we started to try and dive in and try to start addressing some of the information, we really, uh, we, we kind of we were at a crossroads with, with more than two roads to go down. We didn't really know where to go. And so uh, we started, you know, simple and, and broad and we really started to try and gather some information that could at least point us in the right direction to what we needed to address. As we gathered that data, we used just some really simple paper tick sheets, right? At first it was just, we stuck a, a tick sheet on everybody's desk that was involved in the process. And we said, hey, if anything goes wrong, here's some of the, what, what are some of the things that can possibly go wrong in your area? We had them write those down and then we had them put a tick mark next to that anytime that, that happened. So every time there was a new customer request, they would use a tick sheet to tick down, okay, we found this problem on this customer request and we found this problem. And then after a, it was a couple of weeks, we gathered all that data together and it gave us a, a more clear picture of what sorts of problems were happening most frequently. Uh, and that started to point us in a new direction. So that's what we're looking at this chart here, right? So um, how often did we run into missing information? So customer name, classification type, quantity, page count. Um, interesting data, right, Daniel? Yeah, definitely. We. Uh... As always, our, our, our predetermined biases were always a little bit challenged by the data and uh, the simplistic form in which we gathered it was very enlightening. Uh, it was right at directly at the pain source and so the, the information really started to uh, point us in the right direction rather quickly, especially in the second week, which is displayed here. We started to get a little bit more granular information and it really started to highlight some of the, the, the holes and the things in our processes that we needed to start uh, looking at closer and really figuring out what was causing us to, to uh, continually miss some of the information, particularly some of the ones you see there in the low 90s. Uh, th those were really uh, troublesome and it started to help us figure out what we needed to do. And I think that's one of the key things that people, if, if you haven't done a, a Lean Six Sigma or Continuous Improvement Project before, one of the things you'll find out is that the first time you go to gather the data, you'll get it wrong, right? I think we tried to gather data in the first like week or so that we tried to gather it. The information we got back, it wasn't very good. It wasn't very complete. And it really didn't tell us exactly what we needed to know. So then we revamped how we were collecting the data, redeployed the data collection sheets. And the second go around, we actually got what we wanted, which was data that told us where the problem was. Sometimes I, I think Rex brought it up in the uh, earlier when he was talking about their adventures at OC Tanner experimentation was one of their keys and i think here we had to experiment a little bit until we until we landed on that right set of data that we were looking for that would tell us the story that we were trying to understand yeah those biases that you guys had i mean what did everybody on the team think was the real problem when we first started before we got the data yeah I, you know unfortunately Sidra, i wish we could point at one uh, i think i think that was 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 part of the problem everybody had their own opinion uh, a lot of it was formulated that the, that the process was just too troublesome with was, was some of the things that we, we uh, were told, uh, depending on if they were inputting information or the recipient of that information, people had different opinions. Uh, but all of those were based off of whims, um, gut feelings. Uh, it, up to this point, until we started gathering this data, we had no specific information one way or the other. And so I think that's why it's important because it, it led to a solution that was uh, or not so much a solution, but is, is, is a problem point that was identified uh, purely by numbers. It, it, it wasn't opinionated anymore. Um, it removed the personal factor. And uh, this is what allowed us to start diving even a little bit deeper, um, as you mentioned, remembered when we were there. So no, this was, this was the big turning point in terms of when we finally had the information in front of us that uh, found the hole in the process that we needed to start looking at. That's awesome. I absolutely agree. I think the data was the turning point where it went from an emotional discussion to, oh, we're just talking about facts here. 
And that kind of freed the room up to just move forward with the facts, right? Dang. Oops. There we go. So uh, after we measured the process, we moved from the de defined phase to the measure phase, and now we're in the analyze phase. So in the analyze phase, there's really one main tool that you use, and that's root cause analysis. Five Ys, fishbone diagram, six Ms of variation. Um, and this is one example of the root cause analysis, but we did several of these um, to get to the uh, potential solutions on different problems. Um, but if you look at your, from top to bottom, we start off with, with an inaccurate RFQ, a request for quote, and then we look down at various entry methods, and that's going back to that data that said, look, most people prefer to just send the information through email, and then clearly that has some problems. Why? Well, why do they use the email? Well, because the electronic form that they're supposed to be using, that's supposed to be the process, too difficult to use. Everybody that we talked to, whether it was on the sending end or the receiving end said, look, the electronic tool that we have been given is too, too tricky. Uh, it takes too long. The fields don't match the way we actually do things here. Uh, too complicated. There's redundant fields. There's missing fields. There's missing information that we actually need to have that isn't in the field form. And then there's stuff in the form that we don't really need. And they just weren't happy with it. So if you're not happy with the tool, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to, you're going to revert to something simpler, which is email. This is interesting because a lot of times people think, well, you can fix a problem in your, in your company by putting a process in place. Yes, that's true. However, if the process you put in place is too difficult, too cumbersome, too hard, no one's going to use it. And I think that's what we found out, right, Daniel, is, is for some reason we had a, what was in theory a really good process, you just use this electronic form, but nobody was using it. No, that's it. That's exactly right. It was, uh, that's it. It was original intent was for it to alleviate the, the, the problems that we continued to actually eventually find with the data. But it was implemented. And like you said, it, it didn't have buy-in. Uh, it, it, it's using, it's, it's user rate was really low. Uh, we had a massive amount of variance in, in terms of not only was it not being used, but it didn't even have a supplemental, you know, countermeasure process in place. So the amount of variation, as you saw in that first chart was, was absolutely, uh, you know, de just a detriment to our, to, to the process. We had, like you mentioned, you know, email was, was, was very popular. Um, but this process was an, almost entirely circumvented. And so this, this process that we thought was bulletproof um, was uh, just completely bypassed. And, and that, that loop was never cycled again. Once we implemented it, there was no follow-up. There was no tracking of it. And un unfortunately, like you can see here, uh, you know, when we went through and we, and we did that diagram, uh, it, for, for a variety of different reasons, the, our, our, our sales team just refused, almost, you know, outright refused to use it until we started to address the issue. Yeah, yep. a lot of energy. So what was interesting then is um, rather than throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, we thought to ourselves, well, the electronic tool is still the right solution. We still would rather have people use that tool because it stores all the information. It forces people to follow a flow. It's traceable and, and repeatable, unlike an email. So why don't we just find out what they hate about the electronic form and fix it? <laughs> and so that led us down a whole nother path of, okay, let's really dig into why, what does the person's flow look like that's processing this order? And why don't we conform the tool to their flow instead of trying to get them to conform their flow to our tool? And that was awesome because we had at least one guy in the meeting that was just like, oh man, I know you guys are going to force me to use this electronic <laughs> form again, and I don't want to do it. And that was his attitude right at the beginning. I mean, I remember him sitting in that first meeting. He had his arms crossed, his legs crossed, his eyes crossed. I think his hairs were crossed. Everything about him was just closed off. He's like, man, there's no way I'm doing this. And, uh, and uh, it took a, a little bit of work with him to, to, to turn it around, right? No, Cedro, that, that, that's, I'm really glad you brought up that example. So in the previous slide, we, we, you know, Cedro alluded to that we went through quite a few different diagrams in, in terms of, of identifying a root cause. Uh, and this certain individual was, was instrumental as, as we went through this over and over again. We, we, you know, we did a fishbone diagram. We did a, a 5Y. We made diagrams like this. We did some swim lane diagrams and continued to identify all these problems. And... It, 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 we, we kept coming back to this 
variation problem where where we, we there was a process in place we weren't following it and uh, you know, as, as we go to the next slide, it, we talked about the proposed countermeasure. What makes this so exciting about the, this shows the, the power of, of going through the process correctly um, is he was instrumental in the countermeasure of making it mandatory. And on the first day we started, he was very open about his outright refusal to participate. Uh, so we, but the, the, now I know why I'm here. He, did, he, he didn't make that as at a coercion. Um, as we went through the process of identifying these problems, and, and once we started to go down to where, we, hey, what are we going to implement? What are we going to change to make this successful? Uh, the the his demeanor completely changed, and I think he's very symbolic of the overall sales team that was involved. You know, that was the the customer of this end process of us going through this. So, uh, no, the, the the process was really powerful. And, uh, you know, the proposed countermeasure came from the biggest naysayer. And I think that's one thing that we can all learn from this project and example is that the, the person on your team that is the most against change is probably passionate. They're passionate about something. They're passionate about the way they do it today is right. Or they're passionate about, I want to make sure, you know, they do the best job or, or they're protecting their job. Those people and that passion is a good thing, right? If the minute they see the better way, the minute they see a better process that actually works, that isn't harder for them, but it's actually easier, they turn that passion from, oh, I, heck no, I'm not going to participate in this, to, heck yeah, I'm going to do it. And by the way, all the rest of you guys are going to do it too, right? They become your biggest fan. And we, we heard that in a couple other presentations already today is those people just turning. So my advice to anyone listening that is, you know, got that naysayer on their team or that person that you think is just like a stick in the mud, man, your job is to win them you know, win them over and win them over by giving them an easier process, right? Okay, so we made two changes here. One, we got to make this using the electronic tool mandatory, but before we can make it mandatory, we have to make it work for them. So go. Yeah, so here's a here's what the tool looked like. We had this electronic website they could land on, they could click, pick a what kind of F RFQ are we going to do? Is it digital offset signs and banners? Okay, so next slide. They went into the tool. And couple of things. Sometimes there were mandatory fields that already had a selection. So guess what people would do? They would just gloss over that predetermined <coughs> selection and hit submit. And whatever was in that predetermined selection was, was wrong. So we, we fixed those problems. And then we had mandatory fields. And those mandatory fields were sometimes th things that needed to be explained that people would skip. And so some fields were mandatory that shouldn't have been. Some were not mandatory that should have been. And we fixed those. And, and what's interesting is most of the changes that we made to the electronic tool were not like earth shattering, like big changes, were they? I mean, little tweaks right here and there was all it took, right? Exactly. Um, so it, like I mentioned, when we started, we had such little participation and the feedback loop wasn't complete that once we identified uh, the, the problem th through all of these procedures that we went through, uh, we, we, we dove into it. We, we, why is this field here? We asked the question and, and we were using it with the participants of the process. And we found out that, like you, like you said, Cedro, we, it wasn't, they, we didn't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel here. We, we simplified some things. Uh, we, we had some fields that were, that were optional that really shouldn't have been. So we added a little bit of rigidity in terms of it that way. Um, we, we, we made sure that they had to stop think and, and, and process the form and, and you know it's kind of counterintuitive that makes it sound like we added a lot of work to this uh, but it actually streamlined it for them and uh, this remained organic as we went through the implementation phase that we're going to talk about here in a minute we, we we made sure that it was an organic thing we said hey this is our first round of changes we expect more please go use and abuse it and that feedback we got was integral and really getting not only the buy-in from the old naysayers, but even the people who did use it were very happy with the way that the workflow went through the system. And then really what we wanted to help and fix that problem of in Africa RFQs, our downstream process started to see the benefits of that, which is when we started so far upstream, it really bled all the way through our production processes. So no, you would have thought it, would have, it was a, a, a huge insurmountable task when we first started. And Really, we got some buy-in and made the necessary tweaks and we were off and running. It was surprising how close you guys already were to what mm -hmm. the customer, meaning the, the sales team, what, the, what they really wanted. You, you were so close and just getting a little bit of feedback from them and making those changes was all they needed. Uh, it was really cool. 
All right, so we, uh, some of the areas like this one right here, we just, you know, they had multiple things they had to select. And before it was like this big long drop down, And so we just put them all on the page, made it super easy to get to whatever they needed to select. So that one was easy and awesome. And then what happened? Well, this is our data afterwards, right? What happened, Daniel? <laughs> we made some <laughs> data mandatory. Uh, it was uh, it, it was like a light switch. Uh, the, the the removing the variation was the first big win. Um, but as you can see on the numbers here, our our accuracy ratings really skyrocketed. Some of the ones where you see where we have a few percentages, those were human errors um, that the system still couldn't quite you know act as a countermeasure to. But you know some of the other ones, I think on our finish requirements on the other one, it was in the low 90s. Uh, we're up to 98 percent here and inks and coatings is which is another very integral part of our processes was was extremely accurate and uh this this just the, the numbers spoke for themselves so everyone anticipated a, a significant increase but the, the group was very pleased um with this and, and these numbers have remained the same to this day so culturally i think one of the cool things was is because we actually took the time to get the data, which we didn't even have before, right? We were doing, and we implemented these manual questionnaires where people could document every time there was a defect or a misinformation. Having them see the data before and after was not only did it prove that the, the new process worked, but it, it also kind of got people excited. Like, I think there was a general, genuine satisfaction, like, oh, I'm doing my job right. And, and that person in that other department that I need their information, they're doing their job right. And I don't know. I I, it all, I felt this cohesiveness with the team where they were like, "Oh man, we're working together," and 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 this actually is better, right? It, it was. I felt a cultural shift in the team. Uh, we went from arms crossed, legs crossed, to kind of everybody more open and, and and talking together more, and the and the the meetings felt happier. <laughs> if I can <laughs> put my finger. No, on. you you summed it up well, Cedro. It was. Uh... Not only did the processes themselves improve, uh, but the, the the work satisfaction that the individuals got that, that has actually since then, you know, been imposed on 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 our other you know team members has has been phenomenal. It really was started us off on the right foot and trying to go down this lean path. And there's the money slide right there. Accuracy before seventy four percent, after the changes ninety nine percent. The other metric that we're not showing here is you know that employee. Satisfaction, okay. happiness. So, <laughs> so um, number of people using the tool went from 52% up to 100%. Massive improvement. And, uh, and of course, as any good Lean Six Sigma project should have, there should be a dollar value associated with uh, how much money this is worth. And so uh, we've, we estimate at least $130,000 a year in uh, rework. And, and not to mention the poor customer satisfaction of just not getting their job right. I mean, remember, one in four jobs weren't perfect the first time. And now they are, and uh, that, that's a, it's an enormous amount of money, but most importantly, it's a lot more happy customers that aren't getting their jobs late or wrong. Um, and that bleeds over to happy uh, employees that are like, yeah, we're, we're able to do our job better now, which people want to come to work and be successful. They really do. And it's our job to help them create systems that do that. Love it. Daniel, Great. thank Daniel, you. Thank you. No, you're welcome. I, uh, the, the Yuma team has been fantastic. We really appreciate you guys and really the benefits of this project to, have really started to uh, make their way throughout our organization. So thank you guys. Great. Thanks for having us come into your company. That uh, was uh, awesome. Really yeah, fun. <clears throat> fantastic. And so we, we wanted to use our time to both talk about um, an office improvement because Lean does not apply only on the manufacturing floor, but we also wanted to talk about an office environment, which we just did, as well as uh, on the floor environment. And so here with Harvest Lane Honey, our objective was to double the throughput in order to uh, produce our work. And so Jaden is on the line here. Jaden, can you hear us okay? I think you're muted, but there you go. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, yep, we can hear yeah. you. Fabulous. So, uh, so what we'll do maybe, Jaden, maybe you can set the stage here. And um, uh, when, when we started on this project, um, a while ago now, would uh, what would you say is the number one thing that we were trying to accomplish through this project? It was to, to hit a certain number of boxes at the end of the day, finished, finished completed boxes. Yeah, so we had a, a big challenge and then COVID, uh, this was another example where COVID just landed upon the business and all of a sudden uh, demand went through the roof. And so this, this became a huge, huge issue 
of being able to uh, increase the throughput in what we were doing. And so if we were to... So hold on, back yep, up. Yep, what, yep. what do these guys do? What, uh, what? Jaden, tell us, tell us more about Harvest tell, Lane. Tell me what we're talking about. Making boxes, what are we talking about? Sorry, we, uh, we specialize in beekeeping equipment. So we build the, the beehives, the boxes, and all of the equipment that you need to uh, start your own backyard hive. And, and from the, the suits to the tools to all of the woodware, we, we produce all of it. So if I want to be a beekeeper, I come to you guys and you can outfit me head to toe with everything I need. Literally. Need. Best of the best. Including the bees. Do I get the bees from you too? Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. Um, because they'll, they'll sell and uh, deliver queen bees as uh, one of our poor team members uh, knew as she was delivering some bees and some spilled off the truck. And uh, that was not a very exciting time for her. So that uh, we have... Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of great products coming out of uh, Harvest Lane Honey. So if we were to characterize a, a problem statement, we would say that you know due to a spike in orders, we need to increase our through deck, uh, our throughput on our key product on our beehives. And, uh, and so we we formed a team together, um, Jaden and uh, Dusty. And Dusty's no longer with Harvest Lane, but we worked together to implement this. And and where we started our KPI that we started off with was uh, a, around a hundred. A capacity of around 100 boxes per day. Uh, sometimes they would match up with the right number of frames, sometimes not. Sometimes the box would start and stop in order to get the frames. The frames are the pieces that have the uh, plastic inserts that go inside the beehive, and that's the um, frame on, on which the bees would uh, make the individual cells and therefore the honey. And so our target was we wanted to get that from a, a capacity of 100 to a capacity of 200 without uh, adding new team members and without adding more time into the process. This was all about identifying what was non-value add versus what was value add. And so here are just some numbers, kind of where we started off. If we look back in the rearview mirror, back to the year 2018, uh, where we had you know 240 production days, that's uh, kind of an average during the course of the year. Uh, during the course of the year, uh, made over a little over 11,000 units. And so if we created an average per day, that's around 47 in that year. Uh, but, you know, the max capacity was around, uh, was around 100 with a team size of, of uh, 14. And so as we analyzed and tried to, you know, say what were some of the root causes going on in this? And as we looked at the six M's, our man power, our machines, our method, material measurements, and, and mother nature really we found some some challenges, Jaden. Um, when we talked about the machines, um, you know, we we ran into some some problems we identified about the uh, preventative maintenance and the unpredictability of spare parts and and getting those right pieces in. What were some of the struggles we had uh, with the machines and identifying those problems? Uh, a lot of it was that we had no preventative maintenance plans. There was no schedule. We just kind of worked on the machines or cleaned the machines whenever we someone had the time there there was no set schedule for any of it um and then uh, another part along with the machines was that there was no flow it was just the these large batches and it was just pushed as many through as you can as, as fast as you can as long as you can until we have to switch over to the next thing and so we created these large batches of uh, pieces that a lot of the times we didn't even need or were wrong um, and so we would waste uh, entire days doing, doing work that wasn't helping us get any further ahead. Yeah, you're exactly right. And we captured a little bit of that in, in this method part here where everyone worked at his or her own pace because everyone essentially was in a silo, right? And the thing that mattered most was just that people were moving. And uh, it's not that the steps were necessarily connected together, but we just wanted to see a lot of movement. And so, um, you know, one person would work at, one pace, another person would work at another pace, and uh, with those, those, all of those systems or all of those pieces of the pie were not coming together. Uh, we were, we were, we were more worried about staying busy than actually producing anything. Right, and and it is, I would say, probably the most typical thing that we've seen. I mean, we've been to a, a lot of places, and those who've been around manufacturing a long time recognize this right off the bat that it, that what's see, is seen as value is people moving, not necessarily the product moving through the process. And so to do that, you have to become the product itself. And that's what we'll talk about. Yeah, I, I was going to say that's a, 
a principle of lean manufacturing that a lot of people miss or, or you know, it's a very brief section in the, in the Toyota Way and the Toyota Way field book that, that talks about this, but this idea of connecting processes where people don't operate in silos or groups, but every process is connected to the other processes. Uh, and, and so if a problem is happening in one, it immediately affects the others. That principle is foundational to lean manufacturing one piece flow. Um, and it's important for people to, to recognize that when their processes are disconnected, yeah, it feels safer. It's like, oh, well, if this piece of equipment goes down, then at least that other section of the line doesn't go down. Whew, thank goodness we have all these disconnected processes. When in the Toyota approach is just the opposite, right? How do we get everyone to connect us? So we're all dependent on each other. So if anything goes wrong, boy, it's painful. You better solve it. Yeah, and you got to solve it right away, right? You can't live with it anymore because otherwise, if you can live with it, you usually do, right? And, and that's what happens. We bury problems. We just let it go off into the background and uh, bury that. So the improvement plan we had, we needed to create a flow system. That was our, our job number one. Um, and we were going to conduct a, a trial run. We were going to train the team to the new process and monitor, see how that worked. And so, so what we did initially is we took, we, we just analyzed the steps. And so what you can see in these uh, different boxes right here, each one of those white boxes represented the, the, the major steps of the process and the time that it would take in order to do that. And so we just played around with different scenarios uh, to come up and you can see what's the variable that's changing here is the operators. So we started out op kind of seven operators, each doing their own thing. And then we experimented just by moving those blocks around. So this was a visual tool we used to help everyone see that we weren't changing the work at all, period. We weren't changing the times on those. We were just reorganizing the work. And so we use those as a constant, these little blocks of time to move around to show that uh, in, in reality, you could create different scenarios and uh, it would impact the time and impact the number of people. So that's what we started out with, uh, playing around to see what could be possible. And uh, this, is, this is one of those variations where we could analyze the value add time versus non-value add time and which one was our bottleneck and what was causing that bottleneck. And again, this was just a bridge to start us off with uh, as the team, I think, was reluctant to um, change necessarily anything that they were originally doing. And so I think this was a, a mechanism to help visualize the work that was going on uh, in doing that. And this was another variation that we came up with. And, and so the, the key in, in working through this process was helping the team be able to see, to be able to become the unit. And so here we devised a, a plan where we were able to build in certain dry times in, in between certain steps. Um, but the key was that if you were this box unit number one, and if you just followed uh, down through this, in this case, it was, it was a 140 second tack time um, example that we were working through that we were proving out before we changed anything on the floor. Uh, but as, if you became that box number one and were able to follow yourself, um, go through the process, then you were able to um, see where you would go from one station to the next. And then we, up at the top here, you've got operator one, two, three, four, and five, and then the different steps, and those steps came from just those blocks of time. So that was a, a simple tool we used to be able to model out uh, what we should be able to do. So Jaden, what do we, tell us about the process and our team members here, what are we doing here? So the, the process for the box area um, starts out with a, we have a box machine that has a eight nail guns attached to it and it uh, hits each joint uh, depending on what size of box is going through. And then we belt sand each box to get a nice flat surface. Um, and then if there are any uh, cracks or uh, blowouts or anything, we will bondo them. And then they go back to the belt sander, get belt sander one more time to get that nice flat finish. And then the uh, second to last step is a uh, touch up, which the, the guy will go through and make sure that the uh, Bondo stayed and it, it's ready to go over to paint. And then the boxes are painted and then frames are placed in them. Now, one of the things that um, we're, we're looking at these boxes kind of sitting in two rows right here, they're going through a drying process. And uh, part of this was working through a first in, first out and having a maximum capacity on this where before um, as the Bondo was, is, was uh, the drying process was taking place, a lot of these would get stacked up. You would stack it and then unstack it and stack it and unstack it. 
and here we create that a, sounds like a lot of fun though right? just stacking so, and unstacking stacking boxes and unstacking. it is the funnest thing in manufacturing everyone should stack more things more often and unstack <laughs> them because it is so value-added time it sounds value-added and and so working through this so uh, we were able to come up with a first in first out so we could identify how much time the bondo uh, was taking through this process and then create a, a Kanban or create a, a maximum amount of space. So the normal versus abnormal conditions became more evident and obvious. And so it would control the amount of uh, items in between different stages of the process here. And, uh, and so here are some of the results uh, that were, you know, when we concluded uh, the project, we found with the same 14 people uh, we 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 uh, had the capacity to do 200 units per day, where before we had about 100. Wait, so hold on, time out. You're telling me you doubled your throughput with the exact same number of people. You didn't hire more people. Didn't hire there. a single person. Uh, could do twice as much uh, per day simply by eliminating value add and by creating a flow. Wait, how long did that take you to do? So we yeah we worked on this for. Um, you know, I would say we put the project into place and then we tried it out and, and the, from the first time we did it until we were able to perform it a couple of months. Um, well, a couple of months, couple you can of double months. your throughput. Can you do that for other companies or is it just these guys? It was, it was in like the first uh, week, I think, that we were up to like 150 to 175 boxes a day. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it took us just a little bit longer to get the consistency to hit the, the 200. Yeah, it, was, it was a very short uh, process. Yeah. Wow. Nice just, job, you guys. That's, that's just crazy impressive. And, and then we saw some, some residual benefits. You know, number one, the quality went up. And this is something that Rex talked about uh, with O.C. Tanner, that when you had one piece flow, all of a sudden you were able to get a higher quality because you could see what was going through the process. Um, and, and talk to us, Jaden, about some of these other results that we saw, space savings and scrap and, and what other advantages came out of that project. So the, the space savings was pretty huge because at one point we had about 2,000 empty boxes just stacked up. Um, it was about like eight or nine feet high and then it covered a, a, a huge portion of our, uh, um, our warehouse and they were just empty boxes. So they weren't retail ready. There was nothing to do with them. They were, they were hard to count. And so we never really knew what we had. Um, and so with the, the one piece low, as the boxes were getting painted, they were joining the frames at the end and then they were getting retail packaged. And so the, you started with a raw product and you were ending with something that could get thrown on a pallet and shipped out the door that, that moment. Um, and so we, we know how much finished product we have. We know if our frames or boxes are off, which before we would have uh, piles of boxes and then pallets of frames. At one point, uh, we had about 16,000 frames, which uh, is about nine pallets of just stuff just laying everywhere. And it was just a guess of how much you really had and if, if it matched up or if it didn't match up. And so we, we've taken all of the guesswork um, out of it because it, it you you are starting with a, a raw product and you are finishing with a finished product there there is no more guesswork in any of it it all it all joins together at the end and that was it it was it was that was extremely well put it was all about connecting the system so that that once you started adding value by changing the form or function of that thing that it would keep moving down until it all came together and something that was ready to go uh, for the customer and uh, so this is just some side-by-side -side comparisons. We were grabbing some numbers uh, from what has uh, taken place so far this year in 2020. So with about 10 months worth of work, uh, so far the company's done 31,000 units. So an average per day, and they don't, they don't necessarily build these every day and they, they adjust this based on the customer demand, but you know, the average per day is 155, that's actual performance. And uh, with the capacity before of 100 per day and now a capacity of, of uh, 200 per day, just by using the same things. And then as we were talking about this DMAIC, this um, you know, define, measure, analyze, implement, and control, part of the control plan then became to continue to train new people as they came in to implement uh, new preventative maintenance and spare part plans and to improve the changes uh, over time. And here's, uh, here's kind of a nutshell, kind of our last slide um, in this segment here that talks about the results that we were able to achieve on the, uh, the investment that we had and uh, the value of the project and what kind of, of return on investment there was 
uh, for these. So any any comments here, Jaden, or any anything else we may have missed? Uh, no, I it just the the ability to uh, adapt to the the customer demand has been huge. Um, before to hit the 200 boxes, we needed seven specialists. So it was seven people that were trained on how to do each task specifically, and they were the best of the best. Um, right now, I have five guys in that in that same area. Um, three of them are brand new, have only been back there for about two or three weeks, and we are hitting the exact same numbers. We're, we're hitting 190 boxes. Um, and so it, it's not even... And it's like not even a like a worry. You just know what's going to happen because it, it flows and, and it works. And it's been uh, been pretty huge. And then the you guys had kind of mentioned in the with the, the printing group before about the the arms crossed people. You know, it's like I I was one of those people in the in that meeting. You know, arms crossed, sitting in the back. It's big of you to admit that. <laughs> yeah, it was a. Uh, it, it just seemed so. Uh, yeah, it was just so frustrating, you know, to, to sit in those meetings and be like, yeah, okay, we're just going to magically double everything, whatever, guys. And so um, it, as soon as the, the culture, which was, the, I think, our, our biggest problem here, as soon as the culture changed, changed and we, we wanted to help each other and we wanted stuff to flow and we wanted stuff to work, um, it, it just, it, it worked, it happened. And it's been, it's been huge. There's been a, a couple of times this year where we've had to push uh, about 300 boxes through a day. And it, it, it happened. And so, I mean, we've been able to hit those, those like three times what we were able to do, um, which has just been, been huge and been awesome. So, but I, I think that's all that I got. That's great, Jaden. In fact, we've got a question here from Bryce and he says, when introducing one piece flow, how much generally more floor space might you need? And uh, do you find that the move to one piece flow that you needed more floor space for the manufacturing assembly or did you tend to be able to work within the current footprint? And so Our, so for, for us specifically, uh, the actual box area was cut in half. So we took up half the amount of space. Um, and then as far as the finished products, uh, we eliminate, eliminated it entirely because there was just, there, like I was saying, there was a, about 16 pallets worth of space. So I, I don't know what the, the math is on that, but we eliminated that much space and, and replaced that, that with that raw product with um, finished product in the racking. And so we, we have saved a ton of space doing it. There, there was no, yeah, there, there was no adding any space or anything. We, we were able to, to cut down a lot. Yeah, and I think one of the key points in there was that we were able to work through, because there was a fairly fast turnaround on the product, we were able to work through the whip or the work in progress in relatively short amount of time during this changeover process. Now, another company that Sadro and I are working with right now, um, they, they have a longer process, and so there, there is slightly more space that we're taking up right now in this changeover to get them into a better flow process, but that's really driven by the amount of whip that they have on the floor right now. Yeah, it's a temporary thing. It's to, a temporary to thing. transition to one piece flow. Yeah, they, they 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 calculate at least you know around half as much floor space um, once we get the flow implemented that uh, because things will be able to go through in sequence, which is one of their challenges right now is that they they have disparate departments um, that that are not necessarily on the same page, and so the the units don't go through in sequence, and so as we work through those issues, yes takes up a little bit of space right now in the interim, but once we work through that whip, uh, it's gonna reduce probably by about half of what they have right now. Love it, love it, love it. I love right. it, that's such a great job. And so Ryan and I were able to work together on the PZ printing project, but uh, this was Ryan's project with Harvest Lane and then they just did an amazing job. So uh, congrats to both you guys and the whole team there. Um, the pandemic has been good for you guys. It hasn't been good for everyone. It's been good for you guys. The numbers are up and now you guys are able to deliver on those numbers, right? You're, you're muted, Jaden. I'm guessing you're, you're nodding yes. I can't see you either. Sorry, yes. Yes, it has, <laughs> been, it has been good. It's been an absolute uh, insane year for us. We've been cranking out a, a lot of stuff, so. Here's a, here's a great question from our friend Rex at OC Tannery. He says, did one piece flow feel counterintuitive to do? That's an excellent question. What do you think on that, Jaden? What, what do you mean? What, what do you mean by counterintuitive? Uh, that um, that. So when we first started this project, I remember you said, you know, if if there was a better way to do it, uh, we would have thought about it, right? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would agree. 
yeah, and, and that's, and, and so intuitively we were doing one thing. And so then for someone to come in and say, hey, there's another way of doing it, did that seem to kind of throw the logic upside down? I don't know that it was, it was like throwing the logic upside down. It was just changing something that had been the same for so long. Yeah. Like we've been, we've been doing it this way for so long. So why, why change it now? You know, type, type deal. Um, I, I think it was more of, of that than being, uh, it, it not making sense. It's like, we, we've done it. We've done it so well for three years. Why, why change it now when we didn't realize that we weren't doing it well. And there, there was so much more to, to gain. And so I guess you could say it is, it does feel that way. Um, but it, it, it was just being the, not being the, the cross-armed, cross-legged guy in the back and, and trying to, to make a difference. So I'm, I'm going to ask you, and maybe this is a really personal question, Jaden, but, you know, as the cross-legged person guy at the beginning where you're like, man, I just don't know if I want to try anything different. I feel like we're doing a pretty good job. I mean, we run into that a lot where people, of course, people are doing a good job. I mean, that's why they have jobs. That's why their companies are successful. They're doing a good job. So on the journey of change to a continuous flow environment, connecting those processes, was there a, a turning point for you where you're like, yeah, okay, I, I, I can get behind this? Or was it slow? Was it, you know, overnight, like a light switch, you know, just tell me a little bit about your experience. Cause clearly you're like, you're, you're, you're loving it. You guys are, are proud of your success and you're crushing it right now. Right? Yeah. I, I would say there was a, a couple, couple points. And, and one of them was a conversation with Ryan and it was more about, a, uh, he had said um, that we needed to earn the right. Uh, and so he, he had told me that I need to earn the right to, to be the supervisor and to, um, to, to take charge of the, the one piece flow and to, to make it work. And it was only going to work if I wanted to be a part of it. And I, I realized that I was the one who, who was not only uh, in charge of it, but I had a, a huge um, hand on what actually happened and, and how much effort was put into it. So th that, that one conversation of, of realizing, or I guess the, that, that realization of um, it can work if I want it to work, um, you know, cause I'm, I'm the one leading the area. And, and so that, yeah, I would say that was, it was pretty big for me. And it's, it's helped me a ton. That, that conversation was a, a long time ago and it stuck with me for a long time. And we have continued just to keep going and going with all of it. And so. That's a, that's a great perspective. And I got to give a shout out to Brent whose phrase earn the right is one of his all time favorites. That sucker is pounding into my head again and again. And it is such a and great concept. And now it's concept. spreading, like, a, now like it's a virus. Spreading. Well, let's not spread the virus, but if, maybe a wild If it's a good virus, there we go. Right. There we go. Ryan? Yes. This is Rex. Hello, Rex. Hey, uh, on the, on the counterintuitive, let me just uh, clarify that a little bit. With our setup times uh, being a little bit long, it felt like we should, yeah. let's, for example, press five items before we change out tooling and go to the next thing. Eight. And then for us, it was set the tooling up and then we'll trim five and then we'll just keep moving it down. And uh, time we got to where we were putting it in a, a sand, sand blasting cab that it made, it felt natural to do five at a time because you could just do them all at the same time. So for us, it was a huge counterintuitive. It oh. felt wrong. Felt wrong because it, you're you're stuck in the changeover. Well, it's you know, more that, efficient to build 10, 20, 30 of something at once. That's, that's, that's the thinking. That's that's what felt wrong about it to us. Yeah, and that we come across all the time. In fact, that's that's one of a, a, another uh, company that we're working with down in Utah Valley. This is uh, you know a big thing because that uh, how much time it takes to do a changeover. In fact, when we were over at uh, with James uh, over at Capstone Nutrition, one of the things he mentioned that we mentioned earlier that, that one of their focuses was getting that changeover down so they weren't in such a big batch kind of mindset. And when you have to tear down equipment and sanitize equipment so you can pass a, uh, uh, a test to be able to start a new product, yeah, that, that's time involved. And so it's definitely counterintuitive to think that, oh, we should do more of that. That's so fun. I just love shutting down my line and cleaning it. Yeah. That's so fun. Let's do that more. So I was, I was, so I was curious if, uh, if building the, the boxes, the beehive boxes, felt the same way. Did it feel like, okay, well, let's uh, let's glue or nail, assemble five of them, and then we'll take and do the next process and sand five of them together, and then go down the same line. That's that's the question I had. Aiden, how would you? Uh, how would you? 
exactly how it felt and, and everything because our changeover for our machines, I don't know how long your guys' changeover is, but it was about uh, 30 minutes for each machine and there's seven machines in the process. So it, it, at, in the moment, it felt like forever. It's like, dude, I, I can't spend 30 minutes changing this over. You know, I, I don't have time for that. But then as we, we got people trained and, and, and kept refining and going, our, our changeover is down like five to 10 minutes and it, it's no problem. It's like, oh, you need to switch? We'll switch. Like the, the, no, no hesitation, no, no problems at all. Love it. Great conversations. Three o'clock. And I think we'll, we'll close out that part of the conversation and transition into our next one. So thank you, Jaden. Thank you, Daniel. Great examples on PZ printing and harvest.